populations qui sont nées après la guerre, 50 ans ou plus après la guerre, peuvent comprendre et se pencher euh, sur l'événement sans sentir une culpabilité pesée sur eux, alors qu'en fait, ils ne sont pas coupables. Julien Voyage et Anne Mouline nous présentent leur nouveau jeu pendant les années 2000. I'm supposed to be dead. I'm supposed to be dead since 55 years now. But I'm not dead. It was so difficult for years. I have always arms like this because people use, always ask me in summer, it's, you know, now I don't care since years, but during 20 years I, I was always like this. Because, ah, you have a number, what it means? Those who knows what it means, but how did you dare to come out? It's a crime to come out, you know? It's, you, have to, you have to apologize, maybe, that you are here. People was always, uh, ah, what was your system to survive? You know, this is a very good question. I have to, to excuse myself that I survived. I have to apologize because I'm still alive. I survived because I'm Walter Spitzer. And it means something for me. Walter Spitzer's life has been scarred by the Holocaust. He survived three concentration camps in Nazi Germany. Now he is an artist in Paris. Can you imagine uh, if after you finish your dinner, there will come a policeman and take you in a tra put you in a train. Three days later, you be after a horrible trip, you come to Auschwitz, they will say, Raus, los, etc., and put you in a gas chamber, burn. It's inimaginable. You will say, listen, you are depressed. Yeah, I know a good psychanalyst and I will help you to get through this because you have a very bad period. That's it. So this has to, to symbolize normal people which are not used to such idea. I don't want to make modern special art to show off that I'm a very big artist and I will make a revolution with sculpture in the 20th century. It's not a problem. I wanted to make feel people that those people, those kids are normal. People always uh, imagine that Jews uh, are something else than other people. This is a big problem. Walter Spitzer grew up in Poland a country where Jews had lived for over 800 years. His family originally came from Austria, so he spoke German at home. Spitzer was born in 1927 in Teschen on the Polish border with Czechoslovakia. He was a bright and talented boy who dreamt of a career as an artist in Paris. Today Spitzer has fulfilled his dream, but he went through hell to get it. His studio in Paris is like a historical archive. It's a place full of life and full of painful memories. This is his gas chamber. I think it's easy to see, huh? It's a gas chamber. First she got, she got, then get pushing you know, in the gas chamber. Then she get very surprised. What happens here? What's going on? What's going on? Because it's, it's of course, it's incredible to imagine for normal people, picked up in the, in the street three days before, and to get in a gas chamber and to, to get, to, to get uh, killed by gas. Who can imagine that? 
Now this, you know, this hole, it is the, this is the danger of that. It's coming from here. They said it's a shower, but in fact the, the gas is coming from there. So this is a tragic thing. In Auschwitz, millions of people had this gesture, you know, to, how to get out before they die. It took a few minutes to die. They used to say to those people, uh, breathe very deeply, uh, to make it shorter. So you get, you get killed e easier. That, it's horrible. How can one imagine that? Can you imagine that? Inhale, inhale, they give you advice. Walter Spitzer was only 12 when German troops invaded Poland. Being Jewish meant Walter and the rest of his family were sent to a ghetto near his hometown. When the Nazis cleared the ghettos in 1943, Walter was deported and became a slave worker in Blechhammer, an outpost of Auschwitz. It was the first of three camps he was forced to endure and the start of a nightmare journey across Europe. The only thing he was able to hide in the camp was a photo of Paula, a girl he had fallen in love with in the ghetto. This little photo of Paula, it helped me during the whole time in the world and in the camps, because when I was very sad or something, uh, I was often very sad, of course. So I watched the, the photo and I said, I must see her again. So this was uh, pushing, pushing me to keep the photo over any difficulties and to uh, uh, exercise my intelligence. How to, how to, to, to hide this photo? By the age of 16, Walter was the only one from his family still alive. One day, he found the courage to deal with a camp guard. There was uh, like, like bags of cement and piece of wood, burnt wood from fire, and I draw him like this. It was, it was probably a very good drawing. And then I showed it to him. Oh, he said, you are a Kinsler, you are an artist. He said, oh yes, I am very proud. So he said, oh, it's wonderful. So, but, so I said, but you know, if I would get real pencils, real pencils, you know, and real little paper, so I could make it much better. Oh, good, good. And also I said, if I could get a piece of bread, that would, be, would help very, very much. He gave me a piece of bread. And next day, can you imagine, he stole, you know, in the whole his barrack, all the crayons he could. So I, I, I got, you know, uh, uh, weapons with these crayons. I could get killed with this. I have to tell you, this is, this is as difficult than to get to today a million of dollars. With the only difference that if you get a million of dollars, you don't get killed. And in the camp, if you have paper and, and, and a crayon, a pencil, you get hanged. Because it was really forbidden. In the camps of Blechhammer and Gross Rosen, Walter was risking his life. With his pencils, he secretly captured the horrors of the camps and drew portraits of fellow prisoners. People were working outside. They went to this latrine. It was like a small barrack. And uh, in this latrine, we, we make an exchange. So what was my business? It's to, to meet prisoners. They give me small photos. So I make portraits for them. In one hour, I make a agrandissement, make it bigger. So finally, I get shoes, English shoes. Thank God, you know, that this English one, he gave me these shoes, and they was in good shape also. And uh, so it saved me their life, because I, I could make the death march with real shoes. Because on the death march, people was dying only because shoes. In the winter of 1945, 
Walter Spitzer was sent on a death march to Buchenwald near Weimar. His chances of survival were slim. The Germans, they, they were scared, you know, to show the German population what they did with us, how we look like. So we got to work at night and behind the roads in snow. And uh, when somebody fall on the, on, the, on the floor, on the snow, so they get, he get killed immediately with a, with a bullet in the head. So you could see each 10 or 15 meters somebody with a red point here or here. So our problem was with my friend Coco and me to be always in the front of the, of, of the column and never behind, behind, because behind it was really dangerous. Everybody was working not too fast, they would get killed. Weimar, in the east of Germany, was once a focal point for European artists. It was home to the writers Goethe and Schiller and the composers Bach and Liszt. In 1919, Germany's first ever constitutional democracy, the Weimar Republic, had been established here. But it all fell apart. Weimar, the city of great cultural heritage, was one of the first to vote for the Nazis as early as 1926. The town of classical German literature had become a place of worship for the National Socialists. On the hill just outside Weimar is the city's famous Buchenwald wood. For the Nazis, it was an ideal location for a camp. Surviving the death march from Auschwitz, Walter Spitzer arrived at Buchenwald in February 1945. After weeks without food and shelter, he was among the few hundred who made it to Buchenwald. The rest of the 4,000 who started the march either starved or froze to death. They have a big problem when I am in Buchenwald because this uh, entrance is so clean, so chic, like a country house. It looks like a garden where they forgot to put roses and flowers, you know, and uh, things like this to be comfortable. Who can imagine what happened in these places? Who can imagine that? Nobody. I was lost when I was here before, and today I feel lost with this, uh, the difference that I don't feel in danger. You see what I mean? I have no feeling of danger, but I feel lost, still lost. Because uh, it's in, uh, in no man's land, you know? You can think that nobody was here. His arrival in 1945, Walter was sent to the so-called Little Camp, originally a quarantine camp, but later used as a section for new prisoners. Today, nothing remains of it. 
most of the camp was demolished in the 1950s by the Russians. Walter's drawings are rare documents showing what the camp looked like in 1945. in horse stables and tents. The prisoners in the little camp lay on frozen floors and on top of each other. There was epidemic and illness and the constant smell of dying people. But Spitzer once again found a way to cheat death. He managed to speak to a member of the camp's resistance movement. I said, I'm in the little camp and we are dying there. So he said, I, we know this, we know this, what can we do? He said, okay, but I'm an artist, I don't want to die there. Then he looked at me, artist, you don't want to die there? He was surprised because they, no, nobody speaks like this. Uh, so what do you know to do? He said, what do you want me to do now? Everything. Give me a piece of paper, crayon, you shall see. And in one minute, I sketch his portrait. So there came a few of them, uh, oh, he is a real artist, and they said, you have to go to this uh, experiment uh, barrack, where was the, the SS, you know, they make experiments on people. And I saw such a thing there, and this is the first time in my life I see, uh, so heads, Givaro, you know, Givaro, reduct, reducted heads like this, small like this. So I saw this Givaro, I was so impressed because it, it was helpful to see. After a few days, I said to this uh, Belgium uh, underground man, listen, I'm not going back there because I saw too much, they will kill me. Because I saw too much. So they put me in a barrack. It was warm. This is only because I know to draw. So you, you ask me if it helped me, it saved my life. Walter's survival was exceptional. For fellow inmates, there was often no escape. A quarter of a million people from more than 30 nations had been imprisoned in Buchenwald. 56,000 were killed. On April the 11th, Liberation Day, people gathered to remember them. When Walter was sent to the disinfection chamber, he faced a dangerous dilemma. He was still carrying the photo of Paula. We were standing, you know, in line to get in because we had a lot of people. It was after the death march, but it was still a lot of people. And so get slowly inside, inside, inside. And most of us was afraid that it was a gas chamber. So I was just standing and like if I got to, to make to fix up my shoe and so I hide my foot this photo under a stone. This is also surrealistic, you know. I have been here 54 years ago, hiding a photo, came in, in the same place I have exhibit 50, 50 years later. Of my 50 years work I have exhibit inside and a Muslim in bronze. Today, the disinfection chamber is used for exhibitions. The place where Walter risked his life to hide the photo of Paula now displays his etchings and his award-winning sculpture, The Musulman. Musulman is a Muslim word and was the expression used for starving prisoners in the little camp who looked like skeletons wrapped in blankets. Because this is the, 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 the uh, one, one thing of the Jewish nation, mm. it's like a catastrophe. 
Să se seama. Să de fără. Deci este o vină aici. Ai știut după că ai știut mai mult pe gând. Dar te văzut că ai știut tu, sticking to cross to realism. I think this is a big, big word. You know, always when you see art you did, see a few days later, they said, oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't make it better. It's, it's hard, it's, it's true. Everything can be done better, that's true. But I'm happy is here. Along with the ceremony on Liberation Day, Walter Spitzer and a group of French Holocaust survivors accepted an invitation to take part in a seminar. The focus was Weimar's cultural achievements and its Nazi past. Officials and local politicians sat at the front. The survivors sat behind them, but were given no chance to tell their story. In die Nähe der Orte zurückzukehren, die für sie mit grauenhaften Erlebnissen verbunden sind. You have always some professional uh, Holocaust people making speeches, you know, of commemoration, and you know they always said we should stay vigilant. This is just words. They don't believe what they think. Ten minutes after, they go to a cafe, have a good coffee, or a, or a good drink together, making jokes together. With me, they told me, they was very shocked to discover that somebody who's been in that camp so long time ago is still alive, first of all. Dynamic, you know, and uh, this is not a coincidence with the idea they had. They expected to see, you know, uh, very sad people, very weak people, you know, and fatigue, malad, something like this. And they discovered that uh, friends of me, they have been there. They are very in good shape. I mean, uh, you have no pity. It's, uh, I don't inspire pity to anybody. <laughs> we are the a few still alive, and this is our duty to uh, to speak and to to let understand things we think they should know, because uh, I think when we, we should be dead, which many, many dies each year, okay? So then the historian will take the whole problem into, into their hands, and I'm not sure what they will find out. Because uh, already now it is it's a fight between uh, the, the, the survivors, survivors and the historians. So I, I, have some, I have some fights with them in Paris too. I told them, listen, be, be patient, you will die very soon, then you have your revenge. Buchenwald was the first major camp liberated by the Western Allies. But before the Americans arrived in 1945, the Nazis tried to clear the camp. Spitzer was sent on another march to an unknown destination. For the first time since the end of the war, Walter Spitzer returned to Jena, a small town 30 kilometers from Buchenwald. He was hoping to rediscover the bridge where he was able to outsmart the Nazis once again. I think that part of those people, you know, from uh, which transportation we escape, they were killed after, after uh, well, some, some place. They were killed. And so, uh, we was lucky to escape, you see what I mean? Because we was afraid, because they got no more head. The SS was in front, in front, and the uh, Wehrmacht, you know, all the people, they was on the end of the column. Walter was looking for the exact location of his escape. He remembered it was a bridge where he saw the first American prisoners of war in the hands of the Nazis. For Walter and his friend Coco, it was clear that the Americans were close by, so they decided to escape. So it means that if it's the other way, that, so we went that way, huh? That direction, direction.
when Walter discovered the official plaque, he finally found the evidence he was looking for. You could hear, you know, the front, you could hear the bumbling, you know, the machine guns or, or uh, arti artillery, you know. And uh, so we felt that uh, that has no sense to, uh, to what it's, it's a moment come to escape. An American flag was flying at the town hall in Weimar. The visitors were members of the US Army's 3rd Division, who liberated the town and the Buchenwald camp in April 1945. After Walter escaped in Jena, he joined the signal service of this division. He stayed with them for three months, helping the intelligence unit push further east. They had returned to sign Weimar's Book of Honor. For Walter, it was a chance to renew acquaintance with his liberators. What's your name, sir? Walter Spitzer. Switzer. Spitzer. 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 Yeah. S-P-I-T-Z-E-R. Yeah. -E yes. I don't know. You know what Spitzer means in, in American? No. It's a drink that is half seven up and sweet wine. No, that's not my case. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a bourbon drinker. <laughs> I'm used to drink bourbon each evening. We had, I know we had a Ukrainian. We had a Pole. I know there was a Pole because he murdered a Wehrmacht uh, soldier out here just uh, west of uh, Buchenwald. A German soldier? Yep. I, I turned him over to him. Now listen to this. I was watching German prisoners, and I got, you know, that little machine gun, you know, the Schmeiser. Yes. So I said to the, to the soldiers, laufen, laufen, los, los, you know, like they did to us. I just wanted to kill somebody, you know. And the captain, you son of a bitch. What you was trying to do? Yeah. I can understand, understand why that? you did it, you know. But you say, you see, but it wasn't up to us to do it. He was it right. He was right. That's right. He yeah. was right. Uh, he was right. So he, mm -hmm. that was my first uh, lesson of democracy. He said, "Idiot! Therefore, we make war against them because they did that. So we couldn't make the same." But we yeah. were too soft on them. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> 